In this video, we're going to cover everything you need to know about mitral regurgitation, including listening to a number of murmurs recorded from real patients. Before we get started, remember to check out the Murmur Master app, which contains hundreds of heart sounds recorded from real patients. It's also got great summaries on a huge number of valve lesions, so you can quickly get to grips with the key bits of information from presentation to management. You can also test your skills with hundreds of quiz and test questions. The mitral valve is situated between the left atrium and left ventricle. Its purpose is to allow the forward flow of blood from the left atrium to ventricle in ventricular diastole and to prevent the backflow of blood into the left atrium in ventricular systole. The name mitral comes from the Greek mitra, referring to the mitre shape of the bishop's hat, which is felt to resemble the valve's morphology. Yeah, it's a bit of a push, but I suppose it makes sense. The mitral valve has two leaflets, anterior and posterior. These are connected to the subvalvular apparatus, which consists of the chordae tendineae, which are filaments that keep the mitral valve under tension to prevent prolapse, and in turn two papillary muscles, which extend from the endocardium. Mitral regurgitation describes a retrograde flow of blood through the mitral valve in ventricular systole due to incomplete or failed closure of the mitral valve. Mitral regurgitation is one of the commonest valvular abnormalities and is thought to have a global prevalence of around 2%, although it becomes more common as we age. Let's start by looking at the pathophysiology of mitral regurgitation. When the LV contracts, it now pushes blood both into the aorta in a forward direction and backwards into the left atrium. At the end of ventricular systole, the left atrium now has more blood volume because it is receiving both blood from the lungs via the pulmonary veins and backflowing blood from the left ventricle. When the mitral valve opens and diastolic filling begins, there is therefore an increased filling volume or preload into the left ventricle. If this occurs acutely, the patient would decompensate quickly because there is not time for the heart to adapt. In chronic mitral regurgitation, however, the LV dilates and undergoes eccentric hypertrophy, which means wall thickening, but in the context of cavity dilatation. This helps it cope with the increased preload and maintains a relatively normal forward flow of blood into the aorta. Eventually, however, this mechanism reaches its limit, leading to decompensation, LV systolic impairment, pulmonary venous congestion, and impaired forward flow. Additionally, the increased volume of blood in the left atrium leads to an increased left atrial pressure. This causes left atrial dilatation, which can lead to atrial fibrillation. Over time, pulmonary venous hypertension can cause pulmonary arterial hypertension and, in turn, right ventricular failure. Let's now consider the causes of mitral regurgitation. These are typically divided into primary and secondary. Primary mitral regurgitation is caused by structural abnormalities or damage to the leaflets, cordae, or papillary muscles, resulting in failure of the valve to close adequately. Examples include degenerative mitral valve disease, mitral valve prolapse, infective endocarditis, and rheumatic fever. In secondary mitral regurgitation, on the other hand, there are no direct structural abnormalities with the valve or its apparatus. It is instead caused by an imbalance between the closing and tethering forces due to changes in the left ventricle or left atrial size or function. The first major cause of this is abnormal dilatation of the mitral valve annulus, which prevents adequate captation of the leaflets due to physical separation. This can occur either due to left ventricular dilatation, as seen in dilated cardiomyopathy, or left atrial dilatation, for example, as seen in chronic atrial fibrillation. Secondly, abnormalities in the function of the subvalvular apparatus, such as an ischemic dysfunction, where left ventricular regional wall motion abnormalities prevent the normal contraction of the papillary muscles, can also prevent normal valve closure. Now let's consider what symptoms a patient with mitral regurgitation may present with. Most mitral regurgitation is chronic and occurs over time. As with most valve disease, mitral regurgitation is usually asymptomatic until it is severe. At this point, the main presenting complaint is breathlessness, both on exertion and orthopnea or paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. Patients also report general fatigue. As the disease progresses, there can be features of right heart failure, such as peripheral fluid overload and weight gain. Acute mitral regurgitation is rarer and typically due to either rupture of a papillary muscle from a myocardial infarction or leaflet destruction from endocarditis.
As mentioned, patients are usually acutely unwell with signs of heart failure or cardiogenic shock. What about the signs in those with mitral regurgitation? When palpating the pulse, it may be irregular due to atrial fibrillation. AF occurs in up to 50% of those with significant mitral regurgitation. In severe mitral regurgitation, palpation of the chest may reveal an apex beat that's laterally and inferiorly displaced from its normal position in the fifth intercostal space mid-clavicular line. It's forceful and thrusting, but not particularly sustained, as it is in LV hypertrophy. Now let's review the heart sounds produced by mitral regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation typically produces a pansystolic murmur, meaning that it has a similar intensity throughout systole. It is often high pitch and has a blowing nature. But why is the murmur pansystolic? Let's consider the pressure changes in the left ventricle and left atrium. Unlike in aortic stenosis, where the pressure in the aorta is relatively high, the pressure in the left atrium is so much lower than that in the left ventricle that the pressure gradient between these two is almost constant throughout systole. This means that the speed of blood ejected backwards through the mitral valve and hence loudness of the murmur are both relatively constant. Let's have a listen to the murmur in mitral regurgitation. Remember to use headphones for the best audio experience. The murmur in mitral regurgitation is usually loudest at the cardiac apex and typically radiates to the axilla. It is also louder on left lateral tilt and on expiration. Because mitral regurgitation produces a volume overloaded left ventricle, a third heart sound can often be heard as a low frequency vibration in early diastole after the second heart sound, as in this patient. It is thought to be caused by the rapid filling of a highly compliant left ventricle. Now let's consider what investigations are helpful in diagnosing mitral regurgitation. As with other valve lesions, the ECG and chest X-ray are not diagnostic, but do sometimes have suggestive features. Echocardiography is the gold standard investigation. First, let's look at the ECG of a patient with mitral regurgitation. This patient has atrial fibrillation, which is common in those with mitral regurgitation. Next, this ECG shows sinus rhythm, but the P waves are bifid and have a prolonged duration, referred to as P mitrale which indicates left atrial dilatation. Next, let's look at a chest x-ray from a patient with severe mitral regurgitation. There are multiple signs of heart failure, including cardiomegaly, bilateral alveolar edema, and bilateral pleural effusions. Finally, what about the echo findings in mitral regurgitation? On the left is an apical four-chamber view of a normal heart. The mitral valve is highlighted and appears to open and close normally, with no backflow or blood visible on colour Doppler. In contrast, the echo on the right shows significant turbulent blood flowing back through the mitral valve in systole, indicating mitral regurgitation. Echo can be used to determine the type and cause of mitral regurgitation and grade the severity. Transesophageal echo is often used as is able to acquire excellent images of the mitral valve given the relatively close position of the valve to the esophagus. So how do we manage mitral regurgitation? I've once again based these on the valvular heart disease guidelines from both the European Society of Cardiology in 2021 and American College of Cardiology slash American Heart Association in 2020. The management of mitral regurgitation depends mainly on whether it is primary or secondary. In primary disease, we'll consider both acute and chronic mitral regurgitation. In acute primary mitral regurgitation, such as secondary to infective endocarditis or papillary muscle rupture, the patient is usually highly unstable. Once they are stabilised with medical therapy, such as diuretics for pulmonary edema and IV nitrates to reduce LV afterload and hence a regurgitant fraction, urgent surgical valve replacement is usually required. In contrast, the management of chronic primary mitral regurgitation depends on its severity.
Mild and moderate disease is usually followed up with regular echocardiography and clinical assessment. In severe chronic disease, the most important question is whether the patient is symptomatic. If they are, surgical valve intervention, usually valve repair or replacement, is usually recommended. Patients at a prohibitively high surgical risk may be eligible for a relatively new percutaneous technology called transcutaneous edge-to-edge repair of the mitral valve, or TIR for short, which we'll explore in just a second. However, patients with multiple comorbidities or who are approaching the end of life for other reasons are usually palliated as any form of intervention is usually considered futile in this cohort. In contrast, patients with severe primary mitral regurgitation who are asymptomatic may be followed up with a six-monthly echocardiogram and clinical assessment, unless they meet other criteria, such as having an impaired ejection fraction, dilated left ventricle, nuanced atrial fibrillation, or significant pulmonary hypertension. These indicate that the left ventricle is starting to decompensate and suggest the need for surgical valve intervention. What about the management of secondary mitral regurgitation? Remember, here the main problem is not the mitral valve itself, but a problem with the left ventricle or atrium. Therefore, the indications for intervening on the valve are far more limited than in primary MR. Medical therapy of the underlying cause forms the mainstay of management, for example, guideline-directed therapy for heart failure. In patients who remain symptomatic with severe secondary mitral regurgitation, despite guideline-directed medical therapy, a discussion in a multidisciplinary team is usually necessary. Again, those with multiple comorbidities with a life expectancy less than one year are usually palliated. Those with severe coronary disease may benefit from surgery for combined coronary artery bypass grafting and mitral valve replacement or repair. Isolated mitral valve surgery is rarely performed for this cohort due to the lack of proven benefit in comparison to the risks of surgery. TIR has emerged as a minimally invasive treatment option for this cohort. Let's explore it in a bit more detail. TIR is performed percutaneously under X-ray and transesophageal echo guidance in the catheter laboratory by a cardiologist specialising in structural intervention. The idea is to attach a metallic clip onto the free ends of the anterior and posterior leaflet, such to create a double orifice. A reduction in mitral regurgitation can be measured real-time using transesophageal echo during the procedure. Two pivotal trials investigated the use of TIR with guideline-directed medical therapy compared to medical therapy alone for patients with functional mitral regurgitation. The COAPT trial showed a significant reduction in both mortality and heart failure hospitalisation at two years. In contrast, the MITRA FR trial showed no difference in mortality. This was seemingly confusing, but is likely explained by the fact that the COAPT trial had patients with relatively more severe mitral regurgitation and less left ventricular dilatation and remodelling, whereas the MITRA FR trial included patients with relatively less severe mitral regurgitation but more severe left ventricular remodelling, therefore indicating that their symptoms were more likely to be from advanced LV failure rather than mitral regurgitation. Hence, they derive less benefit from mitral valve intervention. More recently, the Reshape HF2 trial looked at patients with less severe mitral regurgitation but also less severe LV dilatation and remodelling than the MITRA FR trial, and was able to demonstrate reduced rates of a composite of hospitalisations and mortality. Therefore, moving forward, patients with less significant left ventricular remodelling or dilatation, but moderate to severe functional mitral regurgitation, might well benefit from TIR, after discussion in an MDT. And that was the Murmur Master summary of mitral regurgitation, if you found this video helpful, remember to like and subscribe. Also, check out the Murmur Master app for more content like this. See you next time.